I think I'm going to go ahead and initiate this video with a little bit of historical grandeur and whatnot, and to uh, start things going, um, including my uh, continuous talking throughout the video. I'll show one of my favorites again, Pyramid Blue. I smoke these a lot because of the uh, healthy price and uh, the great um, flavor that is abounding, not too strong with Pyramid Blues. They really are just, uh, you know, great for a little bit of sour zing and they provide a, a good amount of flavor without being too chalky and without that kind of buildup that's um, really prevalent with reds and, and darker cigarettes. Um, I'll go ahead and light up here. I have been smoking uh, throughout the day quite a bit and I thought I would uh, give myself a quick hour break before I started smoking again, an hour, hour and a half, give or take, because I knew I would be uh, doing this video and whatnot. So away we go. I think I used to enjoy uh, smoking a little bit more uh, flavor-wise because I wasn't as accustomed to it years ago as I am now. Now it becomes just a basic part of life. Um, but nonetheless, to get started, um, I wanted to bring up a quick topic and just kind of ramble on about a, a topic here that is in history and uh, is very heavily related to World War I that we're all familiar with. But it does um, deal primarily with what I want to talk about being the Russian Revolution. And Russia has had such a dark history, um, being a country that spans over thousands and thousands of miles, and uh, being a country with nowadays over 150 million people. Um, there definitely is some, some really strong history in there that I think people should look into if they're intrigued with Eastern European culture or Siberian culture. Um, there are many uh, you know musicians out there who are Russian who I really enjoy um, kind of delving into and learning about. One of them is Nadishana, Vladisvar Nadishana, and he's a great uh, musician who, who's a multi-instrumentalist and does a lot of really deep, you know, ethnic-influenced Siberian music. He's a percussionist, a flautist, and a great string player as well on various instruments. And let's not forget my love of Russian techno. If you guys want to know one thing about me, it's definitely that I love Russian techno and Witch House, which um, Witch House is very dark, kind of dubstepy techno with some interesting, uh, meaningful lyrics in it. Um, I like artists such as Moogle and back to Russian history. I used to really sympathize with uh, the Tsarist cause and Nikolai II. I think Nikolai was very uh, influential in um, forming this kind of reality that is not dissimilar to um, what the French endured during the French Revolution. They were um, starving people. They, they were obviously uh, very envious of what, what people had in the upper classes in the bourgeoisie um, uh, during World War II. They were just unhappy with, with being forced to the lines to fight this war that they didn't want to become a part of. Nonetheless, they, they joined World War II as a, as a culture um, some 20 years later or so. But nonetheless, people were very upset, and they wanted a strong cause to sympathize with, one that was a huge novelty, and that was the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, and uh, communism altogether. So you're looking at um, Tsar Nicholas II's family being tricked into, after, after being captured by the Bolsheviks, being tricked into the basement um, of the house that they were being held hostage in and being forced uh, downstairs where they were all executed summarily and um, they were they were told according to one article that I read that they had to um, descend to the basement because they were taking a photo shoot of the family which must have been very confusing and very um, uh, displeasing to the family altogether knowing that it could be that their demise if they were wise to uh, the notion that they probably didn't want to be photographed in the first place. Their their death was um, coming and, and imminent. Leon Trotsky, after um, the formation of the Red Army, was, I believe, uh, responsible for various aspects of defense in the defense ministry, commanding troops, even um, above the status of a general, uh, per se, in uh, Stalin's eyes. 
And I believe they have this methodology of threatening their soldiers and ex executing their soldiers and forcing generals and majors to execute um, on, on, on site any soldiers who were retreating or even um, surrendering, of course, but who were even not fighting hard enough or were fighting with, with cowardice, for instance. Um, one uh, general, so to speak, who was executed by Stalin during the Great Purge was uh, Tukhachevsky. Tukhachevsky, um, if you aren't aware of him, or if you are, he was later murdered during Stalin's purge and uh, later um, uh, given a kind of, uh, for, you know, uh, forgiveness, forgiven forgiveness after the fall of the Soviet Union. And uh, he was put on a stamp in... Um, uh, modern-day Russia. You'll see stamps of him if you reside in Russia or if you've been to Russia or you collect um, Slavic stamps and, and memorabilia. He, uh, he had this tactic during World War, uh, following World War One, during the Red Revolution, the Russian Revolution, when he would um, lead his soldiers into the center of the battlefield and kind of break away the battlefield and, and weaken the enemy's troops, for instance, and then he would draw them back and then the so so called weaker troops would be drawn forward and um they would trap the enemy so to say so it's kind of like a a piercing veil of um of soldiers who would who would fight the front line and then they would gain a territory and then draw it back very interesting tactic and uh Tukhachevsky did have this particular uh notion of saying things like um so to say I'll, I'll either become a general by the time I'm 30 or I'll die in the process. So he had a very brave kind of mentality um, where he, he, he knew he would either die or he would reach the status of general. And I'm sure many had, had a similar mentality at the time and, and did end up perishing or uh, rose the ranks like Tukhachevsky did. Really chugging on my cigarette here. I'm no huge fan of Vissarionovich Stalin, um, the man of steel, so to say. Stalin was um, obviously, evidently, taking one analytical glimpse at him, a very paranoid individual, and uh, he had a lot of things going on in his mind where he just felt it necessary to lay down his enemies, and he wouldn't give up power in the, in the least bit. And I think there were rumors that um, um, there was a German uh, espionage program that wanted to um, the SS actually did, um, where they wanted to um, frame Tukhachevsky and make him seem like he was opposing Stalin and create the hype um, across the border in Germany that led to Moscow, where Stalin would eventually be, you know, uh, given the belief that Tukhachevsky was planning on overthrowing him. That was a wise uh, notion of uh, Himmler to do, um, to weaken or kill one of the greatest uh, Soviet generals. Um, and uh, st speaking of Stalin, I believe uh, if you've seen a photo of him with that kind of scarf, kind of kind of uh, coif or whatever it's called, um, there's a famous photo of him when he was like in his early 20s or something. I actually heard a rumor that possibly that is a false, um, a false image, and he actually had a stunt double who would take pictures for him, or who would uh, be seen in public for him that would draw attention away um, from the actual uh, Joseph Stalin. Very intriguing stuff. Um, I used to really sympathize with the Tsarist uh, family and the Imperial uh, Army. I think uh, Russia would be vastly different today if they didn't have the Soviet Union. Despite the benefits in science and, um, and architecture and, and whatnot, um, I, I think the Imperial Russia was much more romanticized and would have, um, would have been more like a Western European country today, possibly, if it weren't for the, the, the rise of communism, of course. I think the White Guard, um, the opposing uh, forces that were against um, the Red Army and the Communist Army <clears throat> and the Bolsheviks and whatnot, was um, I read about them. The White Guard was so scattered in their in their organized organization. They held a lot of Western Front, um, a Western territory in in uh, Western Russia during the Red Revolution, and um, a lot of them were Cossacks from uh, the Caucasus and whatnot. But they were just so ill-organized. They, I think one of the main downfalls that I read from a, a historian quoted saying something along the lines of they just didn't have a common cause as the, um, as the Red Army did, and they didn't have the same kind of mentality of, of togetherness. They were more or less uh, uh, bands of troops that were together, say 7,000 here, 5,000 there, 300 here, 
and uh, they did hold it for some time up until about 1919 or so, um, following World War One. But uh, very intriguing stuff. I've never been to Russia, but I would love to go, and um, it just intrigued me. I wanted to share with you guys that really briefly. So anyway, I'll uh, end the video there. Thanks for listening to me. As always, I'm Snowy Croquet.